Hi, I'm Dr. Fatih Abdelbaei from Alexandria, and I'm going to present on uh, CI in inner uh, ear malformation, uh, when and how. Uh, inner ear malformation is a complex uh, subject, so our roadmap to this subject will be as follows. First, I'm going to present a tutorial presentation, and this tutorial presentation is based on the paper of uh, Sinaruglu and Bajin uh, in 2017. And uh, Sinaruglu is one of uh, the pioneers in this subject. He, he has a, a vast uh, majority of uh, uh, publication uh, in this subject. He has a classification by his name. Uh, so uh, no wonder to make uh, his, his paper as a tutorial uh, presentation. And then uh, after that, I will upload the, the DICOM of some of our cases uh, so that you can watch this DICOM. Uh, we will start with straightforward cases and then we uh, will uh, upload a challenging case. Uh, uh, by this, we are going to have an interactive uh, discussion with you about uh, these cases and what uh, findings you can see. And uh, so you can, uh, we can all learn about from these uh, DICOMs. Uh, so uh, here first, I would like to re-acknowledge uh, Sinaruglu for uh, his paper, uh, because you will find uh, a lot of his pictures. Uh, and then uh, we are going to uh, upload the DICOM uh, sometime later. Uh, I will uh, classify our uh, indications and contraindications into four main categories. The first category is the absolute contraindications for CI, where you cannot think even for uh, CI. Uh, this will be presented as follows. The first one will be the complete labyrinthine aplasia. The second one will be the rudimentary autocyst. Uh, and the third one, the atretic cochlear nerve aperture, or what we can call the trapped cochlea. Uh, starting with complete labyrinthine aplasia, as its name implies, it's, uh, there is no uh, labyrinthine structure, there is no cochlea, there is no vestibular system. As you can see in this picture, you cannot see uh, any cochlea or vestibular uh, system. So uh, by its description, there is absence of cochlea uh, and vestibular system. Sometimes it's associated with a uh, hypoplastic or a plastic uh, otic capsule. Uh, it's uh, usually uh, well diagnosed by imaging, but sometimes you can miss uh, it by uh, diagnosing labyrinthitis ossificans. The main uh, diagnostic uh, feature of uh, labyrinthitis ossificans is that you will find a cochlear promontory. Although there is no lumen, but there is no cochlear promontory. But here, uh, as you can see, it is a flat uh, medial wall of the middle ear. Uh, one point to worry about is uh, uh, if you do some auditory uh, test, uh, behavioral test, uh, uh, the, the, the child can give a response, but this response is a vibrotactile stimulation and it is not auditory uh, response. So be aware of this uh, pitfall. Uh, the second uh, con absolute contraindication is rudimentary autocyst. Rudimentary autocysts is one small cavity, submillimetric uh, cavity, uh, which is not related to the internal auditory canal. Sometimes you find an internal auditory canal rudimentary, or you cannot find it uh, the internal auditory canal. And this cyst is not uh, connected to this internal auditory canal. Uh, this, take, this is another uh, condition, uh, this is different from what you call the hypoplasia type 1, cochlear hypoplasia type 1, which is a bud-like, and uh, in the cochlear hypoplasia type 1 you can find a vestibular system. But here it's only one cavity, a rudimentary uh, cavity. Uh, the same point of false auditory response or the vibrotactile stimulation will apply here uh, also. Uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, case uh, where uh, you can find that uh, the canal uh, where the cochlear nerve passes, the bony cochlear nerve canal, uh, is uh, atretic. There is a bony plate. Uh, so the cochlear aperture, or it's termed the bony cochlear nerve canal, so the abbreviation of CA, cochlear aperture, or bony cochlear nerve canal, will be uh, 
closed by uh, an atletic bone, making the cochlea trapped. It does not receive any uh, cochlear uh, stimulation. Uh, the best view we can see in the axial view in the mid modular view. Uh, some normal values that the cochlear aperture should be 1.4 if it is less than 1 it is stenotic if it's less than 0.6 it's severe stenotic and if it is replaced by bone like in this picture it is uh, called atletic cochlear nerve uh, aperture uh, of course sometimes it is associated with a cochlear nerve uh, deficiency Uh, this, this is the first category, which is absolute contraindications. The second category will be contraindications. And some of these contraindications were, uh, until recently, uh, categorized in the absolute contraindications. Like the cochlear aplasia, where you find a vestibular system, but you don't find a cochlea. Or the cochlear hypoplasia bud-like uh, type 1 where you can find the vestibular system also, but the, the cochlear uh, the cochlea itself is uh, cochlear uh, hypoplastic. Uh, again, it is not rudimentary autocyst because rudimentary autocyst is a small cavity. Uh, there is no differentiation between the vestibular system and uh, hypoplastic uh, cochlea. Uh, moving to the cochlear aplasia, uh, here, as you can see in the pictures, there is a normal vestibular system and there is no cochlea. So the internal auditory canal passes directly posteriorly to the vestibule. There is no structure anterior to the internal auditory canal. In this figure, you find the same finding, except that the vestibular system is uh, large, is dilated. The vestibule is dilated. How do we know that the vestibule is dilated? You don't see the bony island. If the bony island is uh, not seen or is small, this means that the vestibule is dilated. And this dilated vestibule with an absent cochlea is usually, uh, should be differentiated from a, a common cavity. So the description of the cochlear aplasia, you don't find any uh, lumen any cavity in front of the internal auditory canal. Posterior to the internal auditory canal, we will find the vestibule. Whether it's normal, it could be normal, or it could be dilated. As we mentioned, cochlear aplasia with dilated vestibule, there is no cavity in front of the internal auditory canal. The common cavity, you will find a rudimentary structures anterior to the internal auditory canal. So there is a cavity is reaching posterior and slightly anterior to the internal auditory canal. And uh, the last uh, issue, we mentioned it before, the labyrinthitis ossificans, where you can find a cochlear promontory, uh, uh, but in uh, the other cochlear aplasia, there is a flat medial wall of the middle ear. Again, uh, there is a possibility of cochlear nerve deficiency. Uh, until recently, uh, it was not uh, implanted, this condition it was considered uh, absolute contraindications, but there are now some papers uh, which implanted the vestibule, and they are uh, giving some uh, results. So it was to try before ABI, because we know that the result of cochlear implant will be uh, better than the ABI in some cases. So it's worth to try uh, cochlear implant, and if it fails, or uh, you can make a cochlear implant in one side and ABI on the other side. Uh, the other one is cochlear hypoplasia type 1, where you can find the vestibule, but the cochlea itself is rudimentary, it's a very small cavity. Uh, for me, uh, I'm not going to implant this condition because the electrode will be, uh, we don't have a very short electrode which goes through this uh, canal. Uh, some surgeons argue of uh, doing it, but uh, for me, uh, this is not uh, a good indication for uh, cochlear uh, implant. Uh, as you are going to see, that there are four types of cochlear hypoplasia. And all of them, that the height of the cochlea uh, is uh, smaller than normal. But the first one is cochlear hypoplasia type 1, is the bud-like. Again, you have to differentiate it from rudimentary autocyst where there is no vestibule, it's only a small cavity.
and of course there will be a possible cochlear nerve uh, deficiency. So the second category was the contraindications. Now we go to uh, the possible indications. The possible indications will be the common cavity, the IP1, the cochlear nerve aplasia, you don't find the cochlear nerve uh, present. This is different, of course, of cochlear aplasia. We mentioned cochlear aplasia. Now we speak about cochlear nerve aplasia. The cochlear hypoplasia type 2, type 3, type 4. Remember, we have four types of cochlear hypoplasia. We mentioned the first one, the cochlear hypoplasia type 1, in the contraindications, where uh, you find a small rudimentary cochlea and uh, uh, the presence of the vestibule. All of these abnormalities have one thing in common, that there is a high possibility of cochlear nerve deficiency. Besides the abnormality which is present, you can find uh, absent cochlear nerve. And this is the reason that all of them will have a guarded outcome. Sometimes they give a response, sometimes they give uh, a response, then after one year there is a plateau, sometimes they give a good response. So uh, this is very important when you counsel uh, your uh, patient. If we start with the common cavity, as we mentioned, the common cavity, there is a cavity which is mainly posterior to the internal auditory canal, but a small part at least is present anterior to the internal auditory canal. How to differentiate it from uh, cochlear aplasia? that the cochlear aplasia is there is no cavity in anterior to the internal auditory canal. Uh, differential diagnosis could be uh, IP1 also, because uh, in IP1 you have uh, cystic structure, but in IP1 we have two separate dysplastic structures. In common cavity, it is only one cavity. And cochlear aplasia with dilated vestibule, we mentioned it. Uh, before. There is no modulus. So here you uh, suspect gusher, although practically the gusher is real in common cavity. Uh, the electrode, since there is no modulus, you don't use the non you don't use a modular hugging electrode. You can use a full band electrode, straight lateral wall electrode full band because you don't know where the cochlear neural structures are present. About the length is determined by the equation 2 pi r, where the radius is, r is the radius of the common cavity, and there is a special technique for insertion. We are going to show it now. This is the first technique where we do uh, two labyrinthotomy openings, in between them 3 or 4 millimeter, and then you pass an uh, electrode, and the tip of this electrode uh, is inactive, and you can uh, catch the tip which is inactive by a forceps from the other sides, and get it from the second uh, opening, and then you push both uh, ends, inside so that the uh, electrode is lying over the wall of the common cavity. The second technique, you do only one banana shaped uh, opening and then you pull, you, you make uh, the electrode, don't pass the electrode straight, but you, you bend it to may have two uh, ends and then you push the electrode with the fascia slowly in the cavity so that it comes and lies over the uh, wall of the common cavity. Uh, don't push it in a straight way, otherwise it will pass to the internal uh, auditory canal. Uh, the second indication, possible indication, is IP1. IP1, this is a cochlea and this is a vestibule. So both are cystic but there is a clear differentiation between the cochlea and vestibule, opposite to the common cavity where it is only one cavity. 
So two separate structures, cystic structure, clear differentiation between them, and there is a figure of it. We have two conditions where preoperatively, I speak now about preoperative recurrent meningitis, not postoperative meningitis, because postoperative meningitis can occur with uh, any case, especially IP3. But now we speak about a child or an infant with a recurrent meningitis before doing CR. If it pre this child or this infant present to you with recurrent meningitis, you have to think of two conditions, IP1 or cochlear hypoplasia type 2. Again, we have four cochlear hypoplasia. We mentioned cochlear hypoplasia 1, which is a bud-like, and then here we mentioned the cochlear hypoplasia 2, which is can occur uh, the recurrent meningitis. Why there is a possibility of recurrent meningitis in IP1 and cochlear hypoplasia 2? Because there is a defect in the stapes foot plate, which can uh, facilitate the uh, passing of infection from acute otitis media to the inner ear and then to the meninges. So if you, uh, you're, the pediatrician referred to you a child or an infant with recurrent meningitis, think of two conditions. IP1 and cochlear hypoplasia type 2. There is no modilus, so there is a possibility of uh, gusher. Uh, the electrode, since there is no modilus, you don't use a modular hugging electrode. You are going to use a lateral wall electrode. You will use a full band because you don't know where is the neural structures. You use the normal length 24 millimeter because the cavity uh, can accommodate the 24 millimeter. Why do we use conical stopper? We use conical stopper because there is a possibility of gush. Of course, we mentioned that all these conditions with possible indications have cochlear nerve deficiency possibility. Here we add that there will be abnormal facial nerves, sometimes abnormal facial nerves. Uh, which make the, your difficult, uh, the surgery more difficult a little bit. Uh, cochlear hypoplasia 2. This is uh, cochlear hypoplasia 2. Uh, what is common in cochlear, all cochlear hypoplasia, that the cochlear height is smaller than normal. What is normal? The normal is the coronal plane uh, the cochlear is the cochlear height is 4.5 or more and the axial mid modular is 3.4 millimeter so in all cochlear hypoplasia 1 2 3 4 there is a smaller cochlear height again there is the length of the basal turn normally is 7.5 millimeter or above if it is less so this can be a cochlear hypoplasia this will only apply to cochlear hypoplasia 1, 2, and 3. Of course, 1, there is no basal turn, but in 2 and 3, you will find it less than 7.4. The only exception is cochlear hypoplasia type 4, where you can find that the basal turn is, can be a normal 1, can be 7.4. So, the criteria of cochlear hypoplasia Two criteria, the height and the basal turn length. The height, less than 4.5 in coronal, less than 3.4 in uh, axial mid modular view. Basal turn, less than 7.5, except in cochlear hypoplasia 4. What differentiate cochlear hypoplasia 2 from 3? Both have the same criteria. In 2, you will find that the cochlea has a cystic uh, appearance. You remember we have two conditions where the infant can present with preoperative recurrent meningitis. Cochlear hypoplasia type 2 and IP1. Why? Because there is a defect in the foot plate of the steps. Uh, there is no modilus, so there is usually there is a defective modilus. Sometimes you can find a small modilus, but usually there is defective uh, modilus. And uh, so you don't use uh, a hugging electrode, a modular hugging. You use a thin one because usually the diameter also is small, a short one and with a stopper. 
Before mentioning the facial nerve abnormalities, we uh, re-emphasize that in all these conditions uh, mentioned under the possible indications, they have the possibility of cochlear nerve deficiency. Uh, here also we have uh, abnormalities of the facial nerve abnormalities. In all cochlear hypoplasia, you can find the facial nerve abnormalities. Uh, here you can find it as inferiorly displaced tympanic uh, segment. Cochlear hypoplasia 3. This is a cochlear hypoplasia type 3. What are the criteria? You should know now the criteria. The cochlear height in coronal is the uh, mid is, you should know now that it is 4.5 in coronal and 3.4 in millimeter. What about the basal turn lens? Only the cochlear hypoplasia 4 will be normal, but in uh, the other one, it will be less than the 7.5 millimeter. How we differentiate 2 from 3? 2 is a cystic structure. 3, there is internal architecture. There is at least 1.5 We mentioned two conditions where there is preoperative recurrent meningitis, IP1, cochlear hypoplasia 2. Now we are going to mention two conditions where there is, could be a conductive element, not only a sensory neural element, but a conductive element. And this conductive element due to the fixation of the stapes, one of them is cochlear hypoplasia 3, and the other one is cochlear hypoplasia 4. And this cochlear hypoplasia 3 and 4 can benefit from stapedotomy with a hearing aid. So the problem is in the fixation of the stapes in 3 and 4 cochlear hypoplasia. Whereas in cochlear hypoplasia 2 and IP1, the problem is a defect in the foot plate of the stapes, not its fixation, which lead to recurrent uh, meningitis. There is no gusher because there is modulus. The electrode could be thin and short, and there is a possibility of facial nerve abnormalities. All cochlear hypoplasia have this possibility, and they can be inferiorly displaced. <clears throat> what is missed in this slide, but we mentioned it before, we re-emphasize that all these possible indications have the possibility of cochlear nerve deficiency. So you have to look for the cochlear nerve size in all this uh, condition. The last cochlear hypoplasia is cochlear hypoplasia type 4. Here it is uh, resembling uh, the head as it is bent on a chest. It gives the appearance of a head bended on the chest. So this is a basal turn. And the apical turns, the middle and the apical, both are small, both are uh, uh, cystic. What about the cochlear, uh, the length of the basal turn here? Is it below 7.5 or above 7.5? It is above, can be normal. Only cochlear hypoplasia 4 can have a normal basal turn. All the others is less than 7.5. But what is the criteria? The criteria are the same criteria of cochlear hypoplasia. The coronal plate height is 4.5 or less. The mid-modular axial is 3.4 millimeter or less. But the, uh, the normal basal turn here, the middle and apical turn are severely hypoplastic and they are located anteriorly and medially rather than centrally. In a normal cochlea, you will find the middle and apical turn in the center. Here you find it uh, more medially, more anterior. And uh, it gives the, the, the appearance of a head bent on, bent on the chest. Two conditions with uh, fixed stapes and can benefit from stapedotomy, cochlear hypoplasia 3 and cochlear hypoplasia 4. Two conditions with uh, recurrent meningitis, IP1, cochlear hypoplasia type 2. There is no gusher. Why? Because the modulus is there. Electrode thin. Have we mentioned that the electrode should be short? No. Why? Because the basal turn is a normal lens. What we miss here? We miss that the cochlear nerve deficiency can be there. 
Again, in all cochlear hypoplasia, there is a possibility of facial nerve abnormalities and the inferiorly displaced tympanic segment, making surgery uh, more difficult. Uh, another indication, possible indication, is the cochlear nerve aplasia. In this parasagittal oblique view, you can see three nerves, the facial nerve, the vestibular, upper, superior, and inferior vestibular. But you don't find the cochlear nerve. Here there is no cochlear nerve. At first, this condition was a contraindication for cochlear implant. But uh, by time, the patients with even, uh, first at first we tried in uh, hypoplastic cochlear nerve in, and it gave a response. And then we tried in aplastic cochlear nerve and also it gave uh, response in some conditions as we are going to mention now. What is the normal size of the cochlear nerve? It should be the same size or slightly larger than the ipsilateral. Uh, or same size of the uh, contralateral uh, normal size, if it is normal. A very important point to, uh, to be aware of, uh, sometime in neonatal hearing screen, you do autoacoustic emission, and the autoacoustic emission is present, adverse, neonatal screening. Uh, you usually think of auditory neuropathy, but also put in mind it could be a cochlear nerve aplasia because the cochlea is normal, so the autoacoustic emission is uh, normal. So you, the, the, the infant will pass the autoacoustic emission test, but after some time the parents will notice that the child will not hear, uh, are not, is not hearing, so we do ABR and we found a profound hearing loss. So our advice is a neonatal screening should be done by both autoacoustic emission and automated ABR to avoid uh, this problem. Your management, the most important criteria for CI in these conditions, if you find any auditory response, uh, behavior auditory response in these conditions, we have to try CI. And if there is no progress, we go for ABI. Some surgeons do CI and ABI uh, either simultaneous in the same uh, operation or uh, CI first and then after some time uh, the ABI uh, if there is uh, no response or uh, in the contralateral side. Of course, the CI will be done in the better ear, better in regards to the size of the nerve better in regards to the audiological time. So we mentioned the absolute contraindications, the contraindications and the possible indications. Now we have three conditions which are indicated and they give results as normal, uh, con their normal peers in most of the cases. The first is a large vestibular aqueduct, the second the IP2, and the third is IP3. What is common in all these three? The common is what is not against what is said was said in the possible indication. That in all three, the cochlear nerve is good. That there is no cochlear nerve deficiency in these cases. Large vestibular aqueduct, you will find a normal cochlea, but the only abnormality is a large vestibular aqueduct it is 1.5 millimeter uh, diameter, uh, or it is more than the double of the posterior semicircular canal. So keep an eye on the posterior semicircular canal and the vestibular aqueduct. And if the vestibular aqueduct is more than double, this is usually a large vestibular aqueduct. Uh, the hearing loss uh, can be late mm, and progressive, so you can find that uh, at uh, screening the child or the infant is uh, hearing and then after some time he will lose uh, this uh, hearing. We mentioned before two conditions with a conductive element. You remember they were cochlear hypoplasia 3 and 4. There was a conductive element and they were uh, prone to surgery of stapes giving uh, a good result with stability. Now, in this uh, condition, and in IP2 also, and in IP3, in all three conditions, there is a pseudo-conductive element. It is not a conductive element. It is a third window uh, conductive element. 
and therefore stapedotomy is contraindicated. Uh, the outcome here is good. Why? Because of two reasons. The, 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 the child uh, has some hearing, and it could be good at first and then uh, delayed later on, and there is no associated uh, cochlear nerve deficiency. There is a possibility of ooze or pulsation, but not uh, a gusher. Electrode is normal. You can use uh, any type of electrode. IP2 is the same as large vestibular aqueduct, but it has the triad of uh, uh, the, the two uh, epical turns, the epical and middle, uh, are cystic, are confluent, and we have a large uh, vestibule, dilated vestibule. It's the same as a, a large vestibular aqueduct, the, the hearing loss can be late or progressive. There is a pseudoconductive uh, element, and therefore, snapidotomy is uh, contraindicated. The outcome is good because of delayed hearing loss and no associated cochlear nerve uh, deficiency. Uh, there is possibility of ooze or pulsation, uh, not gusher. The electrode is normal, and uh, as you mentioned, that the cochlear nerve is usually uh, present uh, normal. IP3. IP3, here you find that uh, usually it occurs in males. The interscalar septum uh, is present, and there is a characteristic shape, the Christmas shape. Uh, and there is a wide opening between the internal auditory canal and uh, the IP3. There is no modulus, and this makes the gusher more 100%, uh, and this makes that the ear electrode can pass easily to the internal auditory canal. We have pseudoconductive element. So two conditions with conductive element, which are CH3, cochlear hypoplasia 3 and 4. We have two conditions with pseudoconductive uh, element, uh, IP2, IP3, and of course, large vestibular aqueduct. And stapedotomy is contraindicated. The outcome is good, but there is a risk of meningitis due to post-operative meningitis due to the wide communication. And uh, there is a gusher 100%. You use a short electrode to avoid entrance into the internal auditory canal. You don't use a modular hugging electrode, and you should use a stopper. And of course, the most important is to use uh, X-ray uh, during uh, your uh, insertion of electrode to check uh, that the uh, electrode is in the internal auditory canal. Another, use, another reason for using uh, non-modular hugging is uh, if, for example, your electrode went into the internal auditory canal and make a loop around the nerve, uh, and you want to recorrect uh, the conditions, you want to withdraw this uh, non-modular hugging electrode, you can injure uh, the nerve. So uh, two reasons for uh, using the straight lateral wall electrode, that it does not pass into the internal auditory canal, and if it passes into the internal auditory canal, you can easily uh, remove it without injury uh, to the nerve. Uh, some uh, key points, uh, audiological issues. Uh, in neonatal hearing screening, you can find uh, a present uh, autoacoustic emissions uh, in some of the conditions of inner ear malformations. What are these conditions? There are two conditions uh, from the inner, uh, inner ear malformations which can have a present autoacoustic auto emissions. Of course, auditory neuropathy is not included here because it is not considered from uh, here as an inner ear abnormalities. Uh, uh, we have the cochlear nerve aplasia. Why? Because the cochlear nerve is, uh, because the cochlea is normal. So this condition, if you, you don't do automated ABR, you can find uh, an autoacoustic emission present and you can miss it. The other one is the IP2 and large vestibular aqueduct because the child at that time is normal, has normal hearing. And then he developed uh, a hearing loss progressively. So uh, even if you use automated ABR, he will pass uh, both autoacoustic emission and uh, uh, IP2. Uh, another uh, audiological issues in uh, looking for behavior audiometry, because it is very important to differentiate whether it is uh, uh, auditory or vibrotactile, uh, it needs usually an expert audiologist, and, uh, um, expert and a patient one to, to, to confirm that there is 
uh, auditory response. The benefit from hearing aid, how do you assess benefit from hearing aid? If the aided pure tone uh, response, it aided behavior response is 40 decibel or better. And if the child, of course, has a, a good language uh, development. Uh, the types of hearing loss, uh, we mentioned that we have two conditions with conductive uh, element, cochlear hyperplasia 3 and cochlear hyperplasia 4, which benefit from stapedotomy. And we have two conditions with pseudoconductive uh, IP3 and IP2. Of course, large vestibular aqueduct will be included here, where a contraindication for stapedotomy. The onset of hearing loss, most of them start from the beginning, and uh, large vestibular aqueduct and IP2 can start after sometimes. It can be progressive or fluctuant, and the, the main advice you give to the parent to avoid uh, head trauma, avoid contact sports uh, for the child. Two conditions with preoperative recurrent meningitis, preoperative, I don't speak about postoperative, preoperative recurrent meningitis, cochlear hypoplasia 2 and uh, IP1. Why? Because there is a defect in the stapes footprint. How do you manage? By uh, you explore the middle ear, you look for the defect and you graft uh, the defect to avoid the recurrent meningitis until you uh, resolve the problem of hearing later on, or if you can resolve it at the same time, it will be great. Uh, in inner ear malformations, usually you have to try uh, hearing aid. Uh, you can try stapedotomy uh, with the hearing aid in hyperplasia 3 and 4. You, if uh, there is no progress uh, of the infant you, or child, you can go for cochlear implant. Uh, if there is absolute contraindication or if the cochlear implant is not giving uh, good results, you go for ABI. And uh, as we mentioned before, you can, in some cases, you can do both of them either simultaneous at the same sitting or sequential. And usually we choose to do the CI in the better uh, hearing or in the better uh, cochlear nerve site. The outcome issues, uh, it can be, it depends on the, if there is a previous hearing like IP2, uh, if there is a good nerve, cochlear nerve, and uh, the number of electrodes inserted, uh, of course. Uh, what was observed in some cases, a child make a progress and then at, after one year there is a plateau response and there is no more uh, progression of uh, hearing. Uh, cochlear nerve is normal in C conditions, large vestibular aqueduct, IP2, IP3. Uh, the, the others, uh, cochlear aplasia or hypoplasia or common cavity or IP1, can have also associated cochlear nerve deficiency, making uh, the outcome more guarded. The abnormality of the facial nerve in all cochlear hypoplasia, and there is uh, some displacement of the labyrinth scene segment, and more important, the dis inferior displacement of the tympanic segment. When it comes inferiorly, it will come to the oval window or to the round window. The IP1, there is a problem in the, the our, there is some uh, displacement of the mastoid segment. In common cavity, also some aberrant facial nerve. And IP3, there is a superior displaced facial nerve, labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, which does not make uh, surgery uh, more difficult. It's uh, away from your surgical field, uh, usually. And cochlear aplasia, of course, there is abnormality of labyrinthine segment. What precautions you should take when you know that there is a facial nerve problem, that you have to use a facial nerve monitor, and you should be ready for subtotal uh, petrosecond. Possible gusher uh, is present when there is absent modulus and large defect. Uh, uh, this will cause severe gusher. The best example is IP3. In IP3, not only there is no modulus, but the communication between the internal auditory canal and the uh, cochlea is uh, very large. So this is why is 100%. In the other condition, due to the absent modulus, there is a gusher, IP1, cochlear hypoplasia 1 and 2, and a rarely common cavity. Sometimes it is not a gusher, it is a pulsation, it is oozer, and this is in IP2 and enlarged vestibular uh, aqueduct. 
the consequence of the gusher, you have to uh, control the gusher uh, before leaving the OR, uh, that the internal auditory canal, the electrode can pass easily in the internal auditory canal. And this is why we use a short electrode, non-hugging electrode, so that it does not pass to the internal auditory canal. And if it passes, you can uh, recollect the condition by withdrawal of uh, the electrode without injuring the nerve. So before leaving the operations, you have to stop the leakage using a conical stopper, using a fascia around the conical stopper. Uh, be ready for subtotal petrosectomy if you don't control the condition and you use intraoperative x-ray or fluoroscopy to avoid uh, entrance of the electrode into the internal uh, auditory canal. So what are your precautions according to the electrode that you use a short non-modular hugging electrode and you should use uh, x-ray or fluoroscopy during uh, insertion. Uh, if there is no modulus, you use a lateral wall electrode like in common cavity and this is how you measure your uh, lens uh, and it should be full bend. You don't use half bend, you should use a full bend. Uh, the lens uh, is calculated as uh, mentioned. Uh, the IP1 also is full bent uh, with a stopper, but the length is normal because uh, it, it is not uh, a hypoplastic cochlea. In IP3, uh, we mentioned it, short and straight uh, stopper and under fluoroscopy. Uh, hypoplastic cochlea uh, use thin and short uh, with a stopper in uh, CH2, uh, without stopper in CH3 and normal length in CH4. Uh, these are the possible syndromes uh, with uh, different abnormalities. In cochlear hypoplasia 3, you can find the BOR or branchio-otorenal syndrome or Wardenberg syndrome. In CH4, you can find a charge syndrome. In IP2 uh, and in large vestibular aqueduct, you can find uh, goiter, pendle syndrome, and in IP3, uh, bronchio-otorenal syndrome, and you look for hypothalamus uh, malformation. These are important value. Uh, the cochlea should be two and a half turns. The cochlear height in coronal more than 4.5. In axial mid modular uh, 3.4. Basal turn length is more than 7.5. And the cochlear duct length is more than 25 millimeters. These are normal values. The cochlear aperture 1.4. The cochlear nerve size, same size of the facial nerve and the cochlear vestibular nerve is at least one and a half size of facial nerve. Vestibular aqueduct, uh, 1.5 millimeter diameter uh, and more than double size of the adjacent posterior semicircular canal. I would like to, uh, at the end, I would like to thank you first uh, and I would like to re-acknowledge uh, Professor Sinarugulu for uh, his uh, contribution uh, in this uh, subject uh, enormously. Uh, and uh, then I would like to remind you that uh, after some time, we are going to upload our own cases. And we, don't, uh, we are not going to upload it as uh, pictures, but we are going to upload it as uh, DICOM. And they can use uh, any um, softwares like Radiant or any other software, depending on your computer, uh, and look uh, in this uh, DICOM and you tell us what, what you see as abnormalities. We are going to start with uh, straightforward case and then at, uh, after some time we are going to upload a challenging case with discussion between experts on this uh, challenging case. Uh, please don't hesitate to send me on my email if you have any questions or uh, query and uh, thank you.